Hey guys, in this video I'm going to go over this time series problem. It says establish whether or not the following function is the autocovariance function of a stationary process xt. And so you're given a function gamma of h and its domain, so the values it's defined on at specific values of h. And you're basically tasked with figuring out whether this function can be an autocovariance function of a stationary time series. So on the face of it, just being given a function and asked whether or not it could be an autocovariance function seems like it would be difficult to answer without knowing anything else about the function. And there are different ways of answering this type of problem. In this video, I'm going to use the Fourier transform to determine whether or not this uh, function can be an autocovariance function. So I'm going to use this corollary, which is from the Brockwell and Davis time series book, the second edition, I believe. And this corollary or theorem says an absolutely summable function gamma is the autocovariance function of a stationary time series if and only if it is even and you can write out the Fourier transform which is this formula and this formula has to be greater than or equal to zero for all lambda in negative pi to pi and if this is true then f is the spectral density of gamma. So that means that if you can write out gamma of h and plug it into here and have these values be greater than or equal to zero for lambda defined on this domain, then this is a power spectral density function of the time series. So basically, if you're given a time series in terms of lags, which is in terms of times, and you can convert it into being in terms of frequencies using the Fourier transform, then this is a, by definition, a stationary time series. So now we have a formula and we have a way of determining whether any function is the autocovariance function of a stationary time series. So let's go ahead and solve the problem then. So the first thing we need to determine is whether or not this is an even function. And we can see very quickly that it is just from the definition of the domain. An even function means that if you have f of x, that has to be equal to f of negative x. You can see here that we have plus or minus two two plus or minus three and zero as the only values where gamma of h is defined. And so we see that the values are the same for positive and negative. So it would look kind of something like this, like you might have something that's clearly symmetric on the y-axis. So this symmetry means that you can plug in a negative value or a positive value for h and the values will be the same. It doesn't necessarily have to point downwards, but we can see basically pretty quickly that this function, just by looking at the definition of it, is an even function. So the first part, we have successfully proven that just by looking at it, that it's even. Now the second part, I'm basically going to use the Fourier transform formula, simplify it, and then see whether it's greater than zero or equal to zero for negative pi to pi. So let's go ahead and do that part next. So after we've proven that it's even, we're going to go ahead and plug in to the Fourier transform formula. So one over two pi is just a constant. That's not going to change. And now we have to sum over all the values of h. So for our definition, we have h can be equal to zero, h can be equal to two, negative two, and h can be equal to negative three, three. So let's go ahead and plug in each one one by one. So let's start with zero. So e to the negative i times zero times lambda is just e to the zero, which is going to be one. And that's going to be one times gamma zero. So gamma zero is one. So one times one is just one. Then we're doing an absolute or an infinite sum. So that's gonna be zero plus two plus negative two. This is going to give you the same value, whether it's positive or negative. So we can just find one and multiply by two. So I'm going to do two times the value I used positive two. So e to the negative i two lambda times gamma when you plug in two. So gamma of two is going to be times negative 0 0.5. And then I did the same thing for plugging in three and negative three. So I'm going to do two times, actually let me write that down here, two times the value for gamma of 3 is going to be negative 0 0.25 times e to the negative 3 i lambda. And the rest of the values are going to be 0, so this is going to be our absolute sum. And let's go ahead and simplify those values. So first I just simplified by multiplying the numbers. So I have, this is equal to 1 over 2 pi 
times 1 minus e to the negative i 2 lambda. So 2 times uh, negative 1 half is just 1. And then 2 times negative 1 fourth is just minus 1 half e to the negative i 3 lambda. To simplify for the next step, we're going to use Euler's formula. So that says that you can decompose e to the i lambda into a real part and an imaginary part. So that's going to be equal to cosine lambda plus i sine lambda. Now in our formula, we always multiply e to the negative i h lambda by the autocovariance function. We just said that the autocovariance function is even, cosine is also even, and sine is odd. So for our purposes, when we multiply sine by the autocovariance function, it's just going to cancel it out and be zero. So for our purposes for these problems, whenever we see e to the i k lambda, this is going to be equal to cosine k lambda because the sine part, the imaginary part, is going to go away. So let's go ahead and simplify using Euler's formula. So we're going to get that this is still 1 over 2 pi. We're going to get 1 again, and this is going to be 1 minus. This part is going to simplify to cosine 2 lambda, cosine 2 lambda, and the next part is going to be minus 1 half, cosine 3 lambda. So the negative part again would just affect the imaginary part, which again goes away. So we just keep the coefficient 2 and 3 in front of the lambda. So now that we've simplified this far, we can either now plug in our domain of lambda, so lambda from negative pi to pi, or I just went one step further and I got rid of the constant in front, so I said this is proportional to the inside, so that's proportional to 1 minus cosine 2 lambda minus 1 half cosine 3 lambda. And we have to check whether lambda, whether this whole section or this whole simplified formula is greater than or equal to 0 for lambda from negative pi to pi. Since we have cosine values, we can plug in pi or 0, and those are pretty obvious values to check. So we can hopefully see very quickly that this is not going to be greater than or equal to zero for all values. So for example, if lambda is equal to zero, we're going to have one minus one. So cosine of zero is one. So one minus one minus one half times one when you have another cosine zero. So that would give you minus one half, which is not greater than or equal to zero, which is less than zero. Because this is less than zero, the definition doesn't hold of our corollary, so we can say that the given gamma function is not an autocovariance function of a stationary time series. Thus, gamma of h is not the autocovariance function of a stationary time series, and we can make this conclusion because the definition uses if and only if. This has to be true for any function that's an autocovariance function of a stationary time series, so since the definition is not true, that means we can conclude that the function is not an autocovariance function of a stationary time series, and we're done with this problem.